5% of the US adult population suffers from full-blown SAM. And another 15% have a milder form where different people have trouble at different times of the year. A season can represent a very different challenge. So you need to defeat your propensity to do badly at certain times of year and feel badly. There are things to do so that you can change that. So I think many of us are very familiar with seasonal affective disorder or SAD, and we tend to think of it about this dreaded thing that happens in the winter, but it can happen in the summer. So let's talk about the summer before we jump into the winter. Walk us through summer SAD. Well, I'm so glad you're mentioning it because it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem. When we first looked into winter SAD, we got tons of questionnaires answered from all over the country, and many people gave us just the usual winter sad story to the extent that there is a common element. But a, a good, sizable minority said, I'm just the opposite. I love the winter. I hate the summer. And it's been there all along, and I would find it on the radio when I was on a radio show uh, and it would be the middle of winter. And of course, the winter people would be too tired to call in. But the summer people would say, well, this is not me at all. This I look, look how I sound. It's the middle of winter and I'm in my element. So, you know, it all underscores what Hippocrates said, that of seasons, some are well or ill suited to summer and others to winter that there are different kinds of people, and that's part of the diversity of human beings and of animals in general that has been helpful to our survival in multiple different types of climates and environments. But what is then? What then is the summer sad? Well, it is a, a problem of mood and energy and effectiveness that comes on usually starting in the spring, intensifying as the summer deepens, and only experiencing relief, if it's just left to its own, to come out in the autumn. So it has certain elements in common with the winter sad, but it also has certain distinct differences. And as the earth warms up, which, as you can see, affects some places more than others, you know, places which are generally known for having warm climates are going to suffer more. So um, I think it behooves us to understand more and more about it and try to understand what you can do about it. So one would assume it's driven in the summer by the extreme heat or temperature and those feeling a little blue because they can't maybe do the things they want to do, out, be outside during the day. And yeah, that's because it, it Am I, is that fair to say? It's fair insofar as it goes, but there are a couple of assumptions there. Maybe it bothers people because they can't do what they want, but maybe they just can't bear the heat just at a biological level. They are eviscerated by the heat. And the other thing about it is that it's not just the heat, it may be the light as well. In fact, there's evidence, at least from a clinical point of view, that they are exhausted by the heat, but activated by the light in a way that is not, you know, usually when we say activated, we think of, well, this is good news. But if somebody is overactivated, it can be very irritating. So you've often got the sense of people who are depleted, not able to do what they want to do, but also kind of energized in a not very pleasant way. So it's a complex thing because these go together, the increased heat, the increased light, and that's it. So we're touching on temperature and we're touching on the amount of light or dark one experiences in their day. Are those the two big drivers of SAD? I think so. I think they're the two big drivers and the light with its irritability, you know, violence peaks in the summertime. There's a lot of data on that, that violence is up in the summer, rapes are up in the summer, um, suicides, paradoxically, are up in the spring and summer, not in the winter. 
And one of the reasons is that you're more likely to commit both violence or suicide, which is kind of violence against oneself, when you're not only feeling bad, but you're feeling activated. You know, most people who successfully, I use that word guardedly, successfully commit suicide are in an activated state, and that's much more likely to happen in the summer than in the winter. I wouldn't have guessed that. I, I would have thought specifically with regards to mental health, it would have been winter. And I, I think we've all experienced the winter blues, so to speak. Days are shorter. It's cold, generally speaking. And that tends to you know, so let me take a step back. If we're, if we're talking about winter sad, which we'll segue to quickly, and summer sad, and we look at how many people are affected by sad, how many people are affected by sad, and how does it split between winter and sad? Excuse me, winter and summer? And I'll, I'll pause there. Our best data suggests that 5% of the US adult population suffers from full-blown sad. Now, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have it every single winter because seasons change. One winter, you uh, have a lot of vacations in Florida, and another winter, you're stuck up in the north. So it's going to depend, but 5% are going to have it a significant amount of the time. And another 15% have a milder form, which we call normally the winter blues. And these distinctions are not hard and fast. Somebody can have sad one winter and the winter blues the next, depending on a variety of factors. But it's the spectrum of unpleasant winter experience. That's about 20%, with the top 5% really feeling it to the point that it gets in the way of their functioning. How do the numbers stack by gender? Well, it's three or four women to, to men. It's, it's a preponderantly uh, female condition with a sizable male minority. It is a spectrum. And so I would assume that the numbers are possibly higher for those who experience it mildly, where there's this feeling, whether it's summer sad or winter sad, that they need a break need to go somewhere else. Maybe the day is a little bit too long or days a little bit too short or too hot or too cold. That's what my gut says. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. When you're dealing with the winter blues, it's three times as common as the severe SAD. In my work as a psychiatrist, obviously, I've worked with people who are very seriously ill. But I also feel that people who are not at their best, who are not doing their best, also need to be cared for and cared about. Because I think, you know, I was fascinated coming to the United States and seeing that in the Bill of Rights, there was the right to pursue happiness, that that is part of what's regarded as one's right. So if you're sluggish and if you're not doing your best work and having a hard time and dragging around, that falls within that range of not being able to experience happiness, and you have, should have the right to have that. So in the work that I've had, I've been delighted to work both for people who are really down and out, and also for those who are just not doing their best work or feeling their best lives. And I'm curious, do the holidays play a role here, Thanksgiving and Christmas specifically? The holidays can play a role in different ways. Firstly, a lot of people who've grown up with SAD associate the holidays with difficult times. So when they hear about Thanksgiving and Christmas coming along, unlike many of the population who rejoice at that notion, they don't. It, to them, it marks difficult days uh, encumbered also by obligations. Uh, social obligations, entertainment obligations, the need to show up, the need to perform, the need to be on your best. What's wrong with aunt so-and-so? She looks like she's bitten into a sour lemon. It, it, you know, the feeling that you're going to be judged, the feeling that in nothing you do is right. She gave me that tea cozy and seems to think I should be very grateful for it, but I, the minute she leaves the house, I'm going to gift it 
to somebody else. You, you know, there's a, there's a room for discord, especially when somebody is not naturally feeling in a great mood and comes in and what's she got that sour expression on her face? You know, here I am, I've prepared this big meal and here she comes and she has nothing nice to say to anybody. Well, she's not feeling very nice. She doesn't feel nice and so she can't be nice. I want to go back to the mental health. I think this is interesting. You said that essentially mental health issues peak in the summer. Are there certain months that are generally very good versus months that are generally very bad? You know, I, I just a small corrective. I didn't mean to say that mental health issues peak in the summer. It's certain kinds of mental health issues. So in other words, suicides in particular peak in the summer. But a lot of you know, general complaints peak in the winter. Um, and I think that's really the key is that different people have trouble at different times of the year. And that's why when I wrote my new book, the old book was Winter Blues. It was, it was winter, you were blue, you were stuck. The new book is uh, much more proactive. It's not stuck on this symptom of blue. It's stuck on defeating. And uh, so you need to defeat your propensity to do badly at certain times of year and feel badly. And that's different for different people. So the subtitle is really seriously considered, you know, a guide to health and happiness through all seasons, because different people are going to have trouble at different seasons. You know, some people in spring, you know, the old saying that in spring, a young man's fancy likely turns to thoughts of love. But then uh, you've got another poet that says April is the cruelest month. So in other words, for different people, a season can represent a very different challenge. And that's what I've been trying to communicate, that just Follow your own heart and your own mind. See how you feel at different seasons. And then if you're not feeling good, there are things to do so that you can change that. That's the point that I've hoped to make with all my work over the years. And I do believe it. We will definitely segue to preparation because there's a lot you have in the book that one can do. But, but I am, I just want to stay on this for a minute because there is that, you know, I'll use heart disease, for example. There's this statistic out there where many heart attacks occur 9 a.m. on Monday. And we can all walk through why we think that is. It makes a lot of sense intuitively. I think about anticipation when I hear that stat. Someone's anticipating the work week, what, what that Monday brings, that anxiety. Is there a statistic or anything that leads you to believe that the anticipation of what's coming in terms of an extreme summer or an extreme winter or a shorter day or longer day or whatever it might be, is there any data that suggests antici anticipation plays a role? And there are certain things we should watch out for there. I think you've hit on a very important point, which is anticipation. Unfortunately, it hasn't been studied quite as systematically. But as someone who's worked with this condition and related conditions for four decades, I've seen it. People used to get full catalogs. Now it's not so much anymore because it's all coming in over, over the web. But they is, I've had women tell me that when they see the full clothes, shivers go through them because they anticipate everything that goes along with the autumn. And um, so it is, you know, the autumn has different associations uh, for different people. And at the beginning of my autumn chapter, you know, I talk about Keats talking about autumn as the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. Whereas Ezra Pound um, says, you know, winter is a kuman in, ludicing goddamn, you know, and he, he's got nothing but curses for the um, onset of winter. So, so I think depending on what your history is, you will take the cues, the chill in the air, you and I might think is a nice crisp feeling. Now, finally, we can walk without sweating too much um, or the beauty of the autumn leaves. And we'll think, oh, well, this is so pretty. And other people think, oh, my God, you know, there go the leaves and there goes the temperature. And the next thing I'm going to be stuck in bed, you know, so, so these we, we learn by associations. 
So these associations are terrifying to some people. And that's why part of what we need to do in relation to autumn for these people and for ourselves, frankly, I suffer from sad. Otherwise, I would never have figured the whole thing out. What we need to do is to say, wait a sec, how can we turn this narrative around? What can we do to make the autumn leaves beautiful again? And that's part of what I try to aspire to um, communicate. So you were recently profiled in the Washington Post and you had a great quote. The, the good news is that you're dealing with a predictable phenomenon. The, the phenomenon, the bad news is that it's not as predictable as you'd like, end quote. So with that said, uh, what, what can we do? How do we prepare? It, it's, it's October, we're recording, this will air in the next couple of weeks. Or what can we do? In my book, I have a checklist and let me go through a couple of these things for our, our audience. I think, you know, knowledge is power. Um, firstly, if you happen to have, you know, marked seasonal problems and you're already in therapy or seeing a doctor or if you're taking medicines, it's a good time to check in. So that's the first thing. But for most of us maybe who aren't, we know we're going to need more light. So we don't realize the extent to which our houses have become dark by winter standards. By summer, the light's coming in through everything and it all looks light. What we haven't realized is that the hedges have overgrown the windows and need to be trimmed back. The windows have developed a layer of grime from the summer which needs to be cleaned off. We should have at least one room that's our bright room. And maybe there's some room that needs a coat of light paint, white or lemon yellow or whatever color is going to make you happy. We're going to need to get some extra light fixtures if we haven't got one already, or if we've got one but it's old and the light bulbs are out of date, they maybe need to be replaced. So we need to be thinking, um, you know, we, we prepare for winter when we don't need to prepare. The whole idea of preparing is you do something before you have to. And that's what autumn presents us with. And that's what autumn offers us as an opportunity. And then, you know, there are other things we establish, we consolidate our social links. Let's say there's somebody that we regularly have lunch or dinner with. We might drop, they might, we might drop them over the winter because it's too much. But if we say, listen, this is what's happening to me. I have trouble in the winter. Would you be kind enough just if I don't call you in a week or two? Would you just give me a buzz? Or can we have a regular lunch date? Or Get your social calendar up and running. Look look at where you're going to take a couple of little mini vacations over the winter and book early when the flights are cheaper and get yourself settled and sorted. Because by the time the winter comes, oh, getting on planes, making plans, blah, blah, blah. It's all too much. Prepare when you're feeling good. And so I go through all these very practical things that you can do uh, because I do believe that you can really, most of us can really feel very, very well through the winter if we take all of this seriously. But I remember one of my early patients referring to a, an Aesop fable about the ant and the grasshopper. And um, you may recall that the ant was working through the summer so that it stored up, and its granary was full and the grasshopper was playing through the summer and had nothing in the winter so he you know was left without food and my patient said to me i used to be like the grasshopper who played all summer long the and i was empty in the winter don't be like the grasshopper prepare so a couple of things i'd like to unpack there with regards to to sunlight how much is enough how much should we be getting outside and how do you think about that you know there are many that talk about the importance of, of that morning sunlight, getting out immediately in the morning if you can. So how much sunlight is enough? What do we really need to not just survive, but to thrive? I'm reminded of some wealthy businessman, I mean, maybe there were many, and they said, you know, you've made all this money, how much is enough? And he says, just a little bit more. <laughs> And sometimes that's how it feels with relation to sunlight. You know, we've got what I've called your internal light meter, a way that you can assess 
have I had enough? Do I need a little more? And it's going to be different for different people. You know, I can say for most people, 20 to 30 minutes of light with a, a good light box or light fixture is going to take you a long way. But will you need to top it up in the afternoon or could, should you get a second one for your breakfast table now that you've got one for your desk? You know, these are open questions. But I think that checking in on oneself is the best guide. Have you had a little bit too much? Sometimes it feels almost like you feel when you've had one cup of coffee too much, if you have too much light. And uh, also you need to prioritize. Like, you know, uh, I'm a meditator and I love to meditate in the morning. But oftentimes in the winter, you know, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a battle going on inside me. Should I meditate or should I get my light first thing? And it's interesting because in summer, I meditate first because I think I'm going to have lots of light, so I'm not going to be caught short. But in winter, I will have my light first because I know that if I do that, I will have more energy for everything that follows. So you need to make these little person-by-person -person decisions based on your own experience, but trust your own experience. Assess what you feel, make an intervention, see how that affects you, and be your own best physician in this regard. So on the subject of light, many sleep experts have a point of view on what we do with the clock. Do you have a view? I do. I do have a view. Well, what I've always found with seasonal affective disorder is that after that daylight savings time change in late October or early November, I and my fellow sad sufferers really suffer because all of a sudden we've got that hour of extra darkness in the afternoon. Uh, now, people might argue, well, you know, we do have that extra hour of light in the morning and there's evidence that morning light is more potent than afternoon light. And so we should be happy with this change or we should keep it up in that fashion all year round. But the fact is, I don't know about you, but I don't get that morning light when there's extra morning light. I'm sleeping in, and many of my SAD fellows are also sleeping in and not really getting the morning light, but we're sure as heck missing the afternoon light. And then the other argument that's been made pertains to uh, the biological clock and what's happening to the biological clock. However, an ingenious set of experiments in rodents has shown that there is a biological effect of bright light or light in general that goes aside from the biological clock. There's a direct effect of light, which we've recognized clinically for years that some people, when they sit in front of a bright light, you can see an effect within minutes or certainly by an hour. You can see an immediate effect. I've used this in my office with clients when they've come in and they feel terrible and nothing will help them. So let's just put a light on you and see how this feels. We'll just keep talking. And very often by the end of the session, they will already be picking up. It's almost like seeing a flower coming up. So that is separate from the clock. So I think there's controversy here, but I say that the afternoon light is, is the taking away that is it's difficult and do something about it. Because there's a view that we should make daylight savings or standard time permanent. And I believe what was proposed on Capitol Hill was to make daylight savings time permanent However, sleep experts have said that standard time is better because it saves morning light and generally more in sync with our natural rhythm. I'm really going to come at it with the eye of a clinician and clinical researcher and say, fix that afternoon light for yourself. If, if the policy says, Take it away in the afternoon, get it back yourself somehow because you're going to need it. And 
you know, if they leave it there, we'll get it in the morning if you have to. So wherever your light is being taken away, replace it. It's a fundamental principle in medicine. Replace what's missing. In my personal opinion, I am also in favor of making standard time permanent because kids, kids get up and have to go to school and you don't want kids to live in the dark. They're getting up early to go to school in the dark and the time they get home, if they have activities, it's the dark and that's just not a place we want to be with our children. I want to come back to routines. What role do routines play in helping us deal with sad? Well, I think routines play a very important part with every aspect. And I think that's why there have been so many books about habits and the importance of habits. And in fact, I have two chapters in my book on foundational habits for staying well. And they mean eating, sleeping, meditating, light, socializing, having good thoughts about yourself. These are all habits and routines. And routines just make things much easier if you don't have to think every time. Should we, like, should I brush my teeth this morning or shall I skip it? No, you just do it. So it goes. And so I am with all my routines, workouts, et cetera, et cetera. I just try to be very routine because to me that makes life much easier and you get all the benefits in a more systematic way. And incidentally, if I may add, I completely agree that there should be bright lights when the kids go to school because it's not just a matter of if they feel better, but it's safer for them because there were more accidents in the morning when there wasn't that hour of morning light. So I don't say take away the kids' morning light, put them at risk just because it might be a little better for our mood. I think let them have that hour, but you or I, if we have SAD, make sure you, you, you take back that hour for yourself in the evening. Kids need light. Kids need to be outside. So something I, I want to come back to is planning ahead. This idea of planning vacations. I, I, I must say, if one does have the flexibility to do this, I highly encourage it. And in preparing for this interview, I, I struggled with the, this last summer in Miami. The first summer we moved here, no big deal. But, but this last summer was, was brutal. And I felt it in ways that really affected me where I am fairly, I am, I say fairly, I'm very active. And there were some days in the afternoon where I'm like, this is kicking my butt. Like I feel dehydrated. Like I need, I can't do what I, what I want to do. And so I'm preparing for our interview. And I said to my wife, I said, all right, like let's plan next summer. So like we're, we're, we're planning our vacations now in October for July, knowing that it's probably going to happen again. And you know, we don't have the flexibility to leave for the whole summer, but we can plan some trips to some places that are going to be a little bit cooler in the summer. And I think that's something that a lot of people can do because I, I don't think there's really anywhere in the country, a lot of our listeners in the States that has perfect weather that is just blissful year round, unless there is, is, is there a place in your, in your studies where, you know, they're 80% protected against sad, so to speak. I haven't done that research that particular question, but my sense is that if there was, the whole board is being shuffled around based on very unusual new patterns. Hurricanes hitting New England, fires in Canada with smoke coming down, um, things are, and you know, smoke going across the country in different ways, tornadoes in the Midwest, on and on and on and on, you know. So I'm sure some are relatively spared, but a lot of places uh, that that you could really depend upon, Maine, you could depend upon. Not always, you know. Now you may need to go up to Nova Scotia. I don't know. You know, you we're we're running. We're we're yes, there are climate refugees, and we're fortunate to be the vacation climate refugees. But it's really, you know, there's there was the old program, no place to hide is becoming a little bit like that in the world. I completely agree. I think if we look at what's happened recently, extreme flooding in New York and Vermont, experiencing wildfires from Canada on the whole entire East Coast. I think it's an important point. You, you really 
th there's nowhere safe with climate change. You know, may maybe Utah and Maine used to be, but maybe not so much anymore. It's everywhere. And so with this, and I, I want us to come back to light because it's a big part of the book and you talk a lot about light therapy because I don't want someone to listen and say, you know, well, maybe I live in Alaska or maybe where I, I go from a lot of darkness to a lot of light. And we are, a lot of us don't have the flexibility to just pick up and go on vacation or we are where we are and there's not much we can do. We can't control the environment. So let's spend a little bit more on light and some of, I, I know in the book, you go into great detail on products that people can buy and what they should look for, but like walk us through what someone should do here at like a bare minimum to optimize for, for light, specifically in the morning and the evening. I think in the afternoon, we pretty much have light everywhere. Well, the first thing that I would say is the audience listening here is going to be very variegated. They're going to be all over the map. Some people are going to be just, they don't like the winter, but they can cope. Others really don't like the winter. Others are really sandbagged by the winter. And so as with most problems, the worse the problem, the more work it's worth putting in to avert it. So for me personally, having lived with SAD for a long time, um, I realized that what I want to do as far as light is concerned is to move from one illuminated space seamlessly into another. So I want some lights you know, and by lights, I don't mean turning the up overhead lights. I mean, I want some extra lights in my bedroom, in the kitchen, at the kitchen table, at my desk where I work out. And that way I can feel as though I'm getting a lot of light just when I go about my normal stuff. Now, not everybody can do that, but what you might find, especially now with light boxes becoming less expensive, you know, people select what they are willing to pay for. And I think that for people with this particular problem of the winter and the need for light, you might consider prioritizing light over maybe a luxury that you would normally take as an entitlement. It may be a better trade-off for you. Everybody's got to make that decision. But for me, living uh, as I have in one of, one of my places, it was an, uh, there was a uh, ancient Roman who has a wonderful quote, and it starts off as, live in rooms full of light. You know, he, he articulates what you need to do to have a good life. Uh, live in rooms full of light. Avoid heavy food. Be moderate in the drinking of wine. Take massage, baths, exercise, and gymnastics. Fight insomnia with gentle rocking or the sound of running water. Change surroundings and take long journeys. Strictly avoid frightening ideas. Indulge in cheerful conversation and amusements. Listen to music. This is 25 BC or so. Who was, who was that again? Very sage advice. I love it. It's very sage advice, but it, it was in Roman times. In, in Roman times. And somebody who just sat back and said, what are the things that I need in order to make my life good? And they're not always the most expensive things. They often aren't. They're often ordinary things that we don't fully appreciate and that we don't give enough time and attention to. Well, how much of this, so you're South African. My doctor, who I've had on this show a number of times, Dr. Frank Lippman, also South African. I love Frank. And he often talks about the bush and in South Africa, this idea, this notion of being a lot more in sync with our natural surroundings, you know, maybe sleeping a little bit longer in the winter, a little bit less in the summer and like really being in sync with nature. And there are studies to support this with sleep. I think I forget where the, I think it was maybe the university of Colorado, like they worked with someone, I, I'll link to the study in show notes, but essentially someone was able to kind of reset their their sleep by being out in nature and like being more in sync versus someone living in a major city with distractions and technology and and all that goes with it let's bring it back to like distraction and being overstimulated do you think this is playing a role in sad as well 
Well, there is something wonderful about being close to nature. I think that we devalue it because we've been so conditioned to need to hear our cell phone ping at a certain frequency. It makes us feel like, you know, somebody out there really needs to talk to us. We're kind of important. Somebody somebody loves us. Uh, whereas, in fact, it might just be somebody reminding us to pay a bill and so on and so forth. So we are addictively tethered to our electronic hyperactive world in many instances. And I think that a lot of times people find that unplugging and the, on the withdrawal of stimulus, uh, you know, addiction that comes and, and, you know, I don't exempt myself from this, by the way. I'm not outside on my Olympian heights making pronouncements. I'm part of the problem. Well, it, I, I experience it, let's put it that way. And I think, you know, I don't know what Frank is really talking about, but it's uh, partly an unplugging. And But I tell you, I have been out in the South African savannas and seen the huge dome of the sky and I've almost imagined how our primitive hominid ancestors could have evolved there and almost felt like I'm returning to some kind of very early part of humanity where the sky is very open and the sky is like a huge dome above you and very blue and not interrupted by so much um, horizon and so much built up landscape. And it's a very wonderful feeling. Take me there. <laughs> so assuming tomorrow you could get funding for any study, what would you do? You know, it's a great question. I would do a summer sad study. I've been thinking of researching that area anyway, but you know, as an individual, I mean, I've had the humongous good fortune of working at the National Institute of Mental Health with government support. If it hadn't been for for government support, the whole SAD story would not be developed as it is now. You know, I had very, I think, wise mentors and generous funding, and that enabled me to spearhead. And after the NIH did our stuff, then people picked it up all over the world, Canada, Northern Europe, so on and so forth. And good quality research could get done. Good quality research, very expensive. However, I think I could still do some stuff in a scaled down way that would be useful. Like, for example, we don't know what have people done to make their depressions feel better in the summer. We haven't even got the, the ordinary survey stats on such a simple question, which wouldn't require double blind studies. So I would love to do that just on the side and have some useful data to share with the public. I'm also curious about the role of physical activity. We all know physical activity is fantastic for one's mental health. In certain circumstances, almost as effective as SSRIs for some people. And if you think about extreme cold and extreme heat and extreme darkness and extreme light, people aren't necessarily moving as much as they want to be. So in my view, physical activity or lack of it is definitely playing a role. Well, I agree with you. I mean, and the physical activity that's interesting, it's not just the aerobic activity, but also the resistance training. And, you know, if people who are expert in the subject would say, you know, you need to stretch, you need an aerobic component, you need to have resistance training, and it needs to be geared to all the major muscle, muscle groups and some isometric stuff and there are actual studies showing that all these are correlated with antidepressant effects. Yes, we have a great show with Dr. Jennifer Heiss on this. We will definitely link to it in the show notes. She does some amazing work from her lab in Canada. Other than picking up the book, which I think is it's a great book, I'll put, hold it up here for those on YouTube, Defeating Sad. What do you want people to, to do? What do you want the takeaways to be for folks out there listening? Well, you know, I should say that every time I have an interview like this one or I write a piece, I always channel it through my website, which is normanrosenthal.com. And I invite people to come and join me there and 
hear people ask questions. I've had a couple of book readings um, at uh, in Washington at Politics and Prose and in Iowa at the Prairie Lights. And so, you know, please feel free to check in and see. We just did a live Facebook event with a, with a um, SAD group, a group of people who suffer from SAD where they fired their questions away at me yesterday and, and it's featured on the on the net. So I try and put out some content and, um, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of other good stuff out there and I'm just trying to do my bit by contributing a little bit from myself. So in closing, let's imagine you've got a billboard somewhere on a, on a major highway and on that billboard, you could put anything to help get your message out or it could, could be anything. What would you put on that billboard? I would put on, don't forget the light. How's that? I love it. Norman, thank you so much. A real pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show.